And welcome to another edition of Trader Talk TV. Today we're Amy Fox from Bliss. Hi. Hi, Amy. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. And today Amy's going to talk about frameworks that are going to help us use data in a post-privacy uh, world. Uh, before we do that, Amy, I want you to introduce yourself and a little bit about Bliss as well. Uh, yes, so I'm Amy Fox. I'm VP of Product at Bliss. So I look after product development, product initiatives, product marketing. Uh, we are a audience first platform that doesn't rely on personal data. So, so what does that mean? That means that we're basically looking at how can we make sure that advertising for clients, for brands is really interesting, exciting in the future, but that isn't entirely based and dependent on that personal data, which is a really sort of a, a, a currency that we're kind of losing mm -hmm. at the moment. So Amy, before we jump into you know, the, the Bliss product, I want to talk about the current state of things, right? Measurement and targeting and the dependence the, the dependence on third-party cookies, even though they're being deprecated left, right, and central, uh, central, and the the sort of you know the over dependence of the of the industry on the likes of Chrome to, to sort of help them keep the, the system going. So let's talk about why it's so broken, right, and why the industry needs to move beyond that. So I think this is a huge problem. I think this is a huge problem because a lot of people don't really understand how cookies, device ID technology has worked over the years, and they don't understand the flaws with relying on it today, let alone in two or three years' time. So I think maybe to, to explain it, I'll go back a little bit and explain how this currency has evolved. I will, I will use the language, I guess, currency quite a lot. And this is really important because our industry, the ad tech industry, is, is super fragmented. It's been built up of a lot of little companies, big companies, all working together to deliver, you know, across planning, across, like you said, activation, across measurement, solutions for brands. Yeah. And that connectivity between these different companies has always been around this currency of either a device ID, which is a mobile sort of cookie, yeah. or, or a cookie, a third party cookie, let's talk about in particular here, third party cookie. And these are essentially IDs, they're pseudo anonymous, meaning you can't tie them back to an individual, so a cookie might be X, Y, Z, X, Y, Z, etc. big number that represents a single unique person. And the ability to ultimately connect them together and understand who's who and follow them through that journey and say, well, I was involved in the planning, I ran the activation, and at the end, third party X tells me that I successfully measured somebody. So yeah. connecting all the dots requires a currency. And that currency is under a huge amount of threat right now. Mm -hmm. It's imploding. And I'll, I'll, I'll explain to you why, I guess. There's, there's where we used to be, where cookies, where they're all now and what's going to happen in the future. It's kind mm -hmm. of three stages. But the device ID space, let's take this one first. So let's say this is 100% of everybody using their phone. So all of the different IDs make up. Now, you know, depending on what market you're in, this pie chart is split pretty much 50-50 down the middle in terms of people that use Apple yeah. and the people that use Android. Probably not exactly 50-50, but close enough. Now, this data has always, not everyone has always opted in. There's always been a big portion of people. You know who you are. You, know, you go into your iPhone, you go into those settings, and you say, I want to turn on limited ad tracking. I want to turn off tracking, advertising, etc." So there's always been a big chunk, somewhat unknown, who opt out. Out of mobile. both? Yeah, out of either or. Both, both right. platforms allow you to do it. Yeah. Both platforms allow you to do it, but normally it's quite hard to find it. You yeah. have to go into the settings, you have to turn I've it off. I've done it. You've done it, yeah. one of those. You're a skeptic, that doesn't surprise me. Um, <laughs> So these are your, sorry, opt out customers. So I mean, I, that could be, that could be 20, that could be 30%, it varies. Mm -hmm. What you then have is some changes that Apple brought to the fore. So lots of press about this around this time last year or a bit earlier last year, where they essentially brought that right to the forefront of the user journey for any app that you have. So anyone that uses Apple, you'll know when you download a new app, new little annoying pop-up that asks you whether you're, you're happy to opt in for your data being used for advertising or not. So rather than putting it at a phone level, they're putting it at an app level so you can opt into some, opt out of others meaning we're seeing a hell of a lot more opt-outs than mm. we were seeing before. We haven't lost everyone from Apple. It's not every single person that's now saying no, but quite a few are. If they say no, that ID, that identifier that sits at the heart of your phone is not allowed yeah. to be used for yeah. transacting media. So there's a big chunk of Apple, let's put it here, that is now essentially opted out. Right. What they've basically done is make it a hell of a lot easier to opt out so more people are doing it. Mm -hmm. Framework. This is getting messy, apologies. But then you've also got, especially in Europe, the impact of something like GDPR. Yeah. So GDPR, of course, another, another level pop-up. I'm sure all of you are used to that as well. So there's another place you have to opt in and dive in through. And we see across both Apple and Android, another large portion of people saying, well, Just actually, disappear. no, yeah, GDPR. And, you know, of course, GDPR is more prevalent and more advanced than lots of other frameworks, but you're seeing these frameworks pop up all around yeah. different markets. So that's only going to start growing. That's not 
It's going to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So what you're left with is this, this sort of small targetable portion of, of data that you're receiving, still very useful, some Apple, some Android, more Android nowadays than Apple, mm -hmm. but, but viable and useful, but small. Do you have an useful. estimate of how big that, that addressable market is, like from your I mean, we, from our data, we see it being at least 50%. So we see it, we've seen a drop, a significant drop of at least 50% across the board right. from, say, 13 months ago to today. Right. It varies depending on market. Obviously, you've got some real Android dominance out in Asia. Yeah. You've got more iPhone dependence in America. You see it much worse in the markets which have the combination of GDPR frameworks and also the Apple. So in the UK, in Europe, much more hampered effect because you've kind of got the double, the double hit effect of GDPR and also Apple's framework. What effect is this having on the current system? So is there... It feels to me that the, the industry continues to over-index to this sort of like portion of addressability in the market, right? And then ignoring quite a lot. So, you know... Well, I, so this, this is made even worse when you, when you put it side by side with what's happening in the cookie space. So yeah. kind of in tandem, at the same time, these are, these are sort of different IDs, right? The device right. ID is the cookie of the, of the mobile phone. Yeah. On browser-based, so whether you're on your browser, on your phone, or on your desktop, you're using third-party cookies. Yeah. They've had a similar sort of thing happening. So you've got the makeup of what browsers do people use. Everybody knows you've got pretty dominant, pretty big dominance from Chrome. 50%. Yeah, let's say 50%, yeah. because, I mean, it does, again, vary by market. You've got Firefox up here. You've got a bit of Safari. Yeah. A bit of Edge, et cetera. Yeah, and a few other A few others, et cetera, et cetera. Um, these guys, a long time ago, blocked their pipe yeah. cookies. So this traffic, you could still sort of opt into it, but in a very complex way, very small people numbers do. So you can basically cross them all out of this. So then you've also got the people that always opted out. Again, same as your iPhone. Yeah. There are people that have always said no. they, they spend their life in incognito mode. <laughs> Don't know if you're one of those. Maybe you're one of those. I am one of those. <laughs> um, so you've got the, the kind of blind traffic. This is this is essentially people that choose to, to use ad blockers yeah. consciously all the time. They're in incognito mode. Essentially, that, that is a little bit, again, that's unknown and that changes over yeah. time. I read a report recently that said in the US, it's around 50% of people using Chrome are using ad blockers, which is a huge number. Huge. Yeah. Um, so that, that, that means this line could be anywhere from here to here. You've got this big portion of traffic, again, making it unreachable, unattainable. So what we know, again, sort of similar patterns here, is the people that are left, who are able to be sort of identified by a cookie, they're significantly less than 50%. So I, Best guess, I, 30 I, less. I did a piece last week, and I was guesstimating it might be 30%. Right? Yeah, I mean, that's a pretty good guess, right? I'd say. And then you could argue this could be between 40 and 50%, right? So Well, these also might not be the same people, or they could be exactly the same people. Yeah. So maybe it is, because you know, opt-in habits are probably common across both. So you're getting this tiny portion of... These guys, a tiny portion of these guys. And then in Europe, the complete inability to join them together. So cross-device, especially yeah. in the UK now, yeah. is kind of dead on the vine because of GDPR. So cross-device no longer a thing. Can't connect them together. The entire model is and yet, And yet we still yet. have an industry completely obsessed. Uh, obsessed and dependent on this dying mess. And it's when, you, when you see it like this, you start <laughs> to realize, what are we doing? You know, you, you're just basically keeping a, a bad system going. So let's talk about the frameworks post ID, post cookie, because yeah. that's really important, right? This is the current state of things. We're in trouble. It's dying slowly. People don't want to move. Obviously, Chrome have kind of dragged their feet um, two weeks ago, three weeks ago when they announced that they're going to sort of put off the deprecation of cookies. Uh, to 2024. But it doesn't matter. You've seen here that the whole space is collapsing in on itself. So what we're going to talk about now is probably frameworks that work in the post-ID, post-cookie world. And these are important because we still want to use data for measuring and targeting, and brands and agencies want to know how, what's possible. So I guess we want to talk this about... This is hard. You need to go. <laughs> you need to take yeah. it. It's hard work. <laughs> You've given me a pen that does not rub out. <laughs> um, okay. Good. We've got a messy baseline. Um, maybe I'll try. Look at that. I'll try and be more concatenated. Don't That's do that fine. again. Um, perfect, perfect yeah. segue. Yeah. So, so what are the alternatives? I'm going to do a little chart up here. Sure. Which is essentially how good are the alternatives? This is my how acceptable are they? And I guess <laughs> <laughs> there are two factors to consider. I think what really matters to marketer two things. Number one is reaching 100% of your audience. If you're yeah. a big brand, if you're your IKEA, your McDonald's, you spend money on advertising, you do not want to just be reaching 15% yeah. of your customers. Yeah, of course. What's the, I mean, it's not the point. So, Wasted money. So let's call that reach, um, or let's call it yeah, audience reach, essentially. So what percentage of your audience are you reaching? Up here, you've got 100%. Down here, you've got zero. Yeah. 
And then you've got performance, of course, because performance will always be the single most important thing for any advertiser. Yeah. You know, knowing that, it, that, that things it works. So, so on this little bar chart of performance versus reach, where do the alternatives sit? Uh, there's kind of three core buckets. There's lots of different things that are happening, but three core buckets you're seeing people in. Bucket number one, uh, people that are basically going, do nothing. <laughs> These are the people that are going, cookies and IDs will continue to exist by the people that do opt-ins. They're not going away ever completely. We can continue to use them. They're part of the mix, basically. Yeah, they're part of the mix, and they're right. not really worried about it. Now, this is, for me, a problem. This is a problem because in the old days, in the world where everybody was opting in and we had a lot of people using cookies, cookies definitely set up here. Yeah. Cookies, I'm going to put cookies and device IDs, yeah. both of them. They drove amazing scale because lots of people were opting in all over the shop and they drove performance mm -hmm. because, of course, being able to track someone end-to-end -end is a great technology to get mm -hmm. ROI. Now, as I've shown you before, that's now under threat. So today, already, we've seen this from a scale perspective drop, if we're going to estimate, down to about 30%. Cookies and device IDs over here. So kind of pulling down in terms of performance. So this is where they are. This is where they were yesterday. This is maybe where they are today. As we go through time, as Chrome keep delaying, but eventually get around to making the changes they're going to make, we're going to see it move even further to a point where what you're seeing here is, and probably even a drop down in terms of performance, because in instinctively, if you're getting such a small amount of scale, you're going to get poor performance. Yeah. Cookies and device IDs are going to end up somewhere around here. This is why it's a problem today. Uh, this is tomorrow, sorry. Tomorrow. This is and why it's a problem today. I mean, it's right? not too far away. If we say tomorrow, it's not like yeah, four I mean, years is, or yeah. five years. It's quite, it's quite close. So if we look at the status here of the alternatives that are being built. So that's where you're at. You're, you're getting good performance, fine, but you're getting such a small amount of yeah, scale yeah. that it is an issue. Yeah. Uh, part two, I'm not going to do great colors here, is going to be alternatives to this, replacements. Right. These are people that are going, mm, can we come up with a solution that looks kind of similar, allows everything to keep working as it is, doesn't really rock the boat. And this is predominantly being done under the guise of unified IDs. These are ultimately, for those who don't know, it's a technology where instead of having a cookie when you browse something, it's having a email address that's used as a baseline. And by the way, hashed emails are the next thing that uh, privacy zealots and government oh. or agencies are going to come out. They're going to go to town. I yeah. mean, imagine these cookies are anonymized pseudo identifiers that mean nothing. Just a bit this of is your. Yeah. This is, it's my name and my, my surname. Yeah. My email. I mean, it's much worse. So there are a lot of there are a lot of question marks around this. Some of the question marks around privacy. This is not going to float. I think GDPR are going to go to town on it and yeah. say it's not good enough. Number two, how many websites are you willing to give your email address on when you're browsing it every single time? There's going to be a scale issue in terms of pervasiveness. Mm -hmm. And then there's also going to be a fragmentation issue because for this to work, every body in the industry, fragmentation, has to kind of move on that adoption line. And that's not going to be easy or quick. You know, it takes Well, you've got to have Apple involved. You've got to have Google involved. It just can't be just you've ad tech companies. every publisher has Pub to... If I was a publisher, I wouldn't be giving my emails out as a, as a, as a rule. Because or make it, yeah, and make it, and make it even saying to your customers, you can't access my website unless you've logged in. Yeah. You're going to lose a portion of your people. Yeah, so, and you're going to have serious tra passive wide traffic that just says, I'm not giving up my email. Exactly. So, you know, these guys are green. Let's make these guys red. I'm going to need your blue pen in a minute when you're holding Oh, it. that's fine. <laughs> the um, unified ID guys, it's going to be perform yeah. less and it's going to have less reach because fewer people are going to opt in. It's basically a worse idea, if I'm honest. There you go. <laughs> it may come up. There may be some, unified IDs will probably have a place. There will be some data that we're useful, but mm -hmm. it's not going to give us mm -hmm. enough. It's not going to fix the problem. Okay. It's going to be a part of the problem. Next alternative that's getting a lot of airwaves is context, which is basically what are you reading now? Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you're, on the, if you're on the Guardian, you're on the travel section, you're reading an article about, um, I don't know, traveling in Croatia, mm -hmm. that does say something about mm -hmm. you. It gives some indication. Now, context is, is going to be very useful. It's very scaled. Obviously, for every single buying opportunity, generally speaking, you can tell what context somebody is in right now. Yeah. It does have its utility, but it's very one dimensional. That would be one of my big, my big question marks about it. It only allows you to understand one thing about that audience. Now, you know, I might spend a lot of time browsing Ferrari cars, Lamborghini cars online. I am certainly not in a position to buy one for myself. Right. Um, somewhat, there's, there's a strong argument for saying, yes, this is one dimensional. It's only looking at what you're doing today. It's also a little bit aspirational. Right. Still useful, I think. I don't. I wouldn't dismiss context. It's not viable, but it's just about it being a little bit one-sided. Right. So if you put it, if we're going to map this back onto our little, onto our little. Here you go. Map. So context here. It's probably going to be much higher reach because when it comes to buying, you don't need a cookie or a device no, ID because you you're only. Need. You just need to know what publisher you're exactly. on, what bit of the publisher, etc. So no scale problems at all. You're going to be right up here. 
but performance-wise, uh, with context, you're going to be struggling. You're going to struggle, probably. Right. It's not going to perform because you know less data, less viable data, performance issues. So, I mean, is this really the landscape we're going to give clients? Which is your options are either one, like high performance but terrible reach. And there are some question marks. I put these in the high performance bucket, but I'm bringing them down on purpose because if you're not reaching 100% of your audience, your performance is going to be limited because you could be, you could be driving so much more performance if you were reaching that full mm. audience base. So, mm. you know, this is almost an optimistic view. So I think, you know, is the industry doing enough? I don't think so. Is the industry moving quickly enough? Not really. All of these are kind of slowly moving forward, little initiatives, pop-ups. I think we need to be bigger, bolder, braver. I think we need to be more disruptive. Try something different. Okay, what is that? <laughs> well, that's where I guess we're going to come in with what, what we're looking at. And we're right. really looking at sitting, of course, right up here, where, where, where that sort of old cookie used to be, which is this sort of hot spot of making sure we are able to use really good quality personal data yeah. in a way that's combined with context and other signals to make sure that we can do really interesting, and we, we call it from our side, dynamic audience targeting. Okay. So how do we make sure we can reach an audience or identify an audience in a way that gets you the best of both worlds, because an advertiser shouldn't really have to compromise between performance and scale. Both right. are equally important, and they're tied into one another. Mm -hmm. So what's your secret sauce, then? So if you look at these three pieces here, um, the cookie device, which is still going to be a thing, but not as effective. Unifier, these, as you said, haven't got scale, and there's a huge issue around privacy, and then context, which is amazing at scale, but potentially performance. So if you could take all of these signals together. Okay, I'm rubbing right, it again. <laughs> good, good. Um, and bring it together. How, how would you make that work? How can you technically do it? It's yeah, a good question. But the, the, the thing is, I, for me, it, it, there is, there's a place for all of these signals. Yeah, I agree. And it's how you bring them together. Because there's not one, there's not one sort of um, you know, panacea here or one solution. Like UID is being pushed by a lot of ad, um, you know, ad tech vendors because they see that as the, the, the system that allows them to match IDs, right? And we know that's gonna be a bit difficult in the current, in the current uh, ecosystem to do that because of Apple, because of Google, because of privacy, because of a lot of things. Um, context, as you said, it's, it's, it, they're, they're, it's huge, you can scale, but again, the, the various things that hold it back in terms of like, you know, real intent, um, knowing more about the, um, the user, and then obviously cookies have their problems. So how do you bring all that together, what you guys are doing? Because that's interesting. And this is important because there are many frameworks out there that are actually been built for this, and it's, it's interesting. But you've got a unique flavor, and I want to know a little bit more about yeah, that. Yeah, we do. And, I, and I, it, they, you're right. They completely tie back in. I'll take you on a little bit of a journey about how our technology works. Yeah. And hopefully you'll see how then we've, we've, um, we've framed that. I guess the key to us is that we, we've built inferential models based off very valuable and useful data mm -hmm. to help us understand where we can find audiences that, that really index highly for being essentially the people that we, we, we treat it as our seed. And we talk, we talk a lot about seed, I guess. We talk about identifying that, that initial audience, identifying. Now for me, this is where cookies, maids, first party data. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, when I say maids, I do mean device IDs. Because yeah. They're used interchangeably really. Device IDs, and I'll come back to first party because this is gonna be really viable here. Yeah. First party data is gonna be so viable and yeah. so useful. You start with a baseline of something really useful. It may not be representative of 100% of your audience, but it's powerful. Now, then you, you move into essentially what we would say uh, mapping and enriching, and I'll come back to this in a minute and show you what that means. And then you, you move through to, I guess, activating. How do you make sure that this thing can be activated in a way that works and is sort of privacy-free, yeah. not dependent? Now, the, the key thing of this is, you can't use anything as a seed audience. You can't just use any old, old piece. You have to make sure you use, I guess, three or four core things. Number one, this might be a collection of device IDs that have done something. Yeah. So, for example, we, our heritage, our background, our DNA is location behavioral data, so how people move around in the real world. This is equally as applicable for first party data. So, if let's take IKEA as an example, they have an app, they have IDs that represent the customers that have downloaded their app. This can be fed into a model like this super easily. So what you're basically saying is, I want to put into here device IDs or cookies. So that would be my device ID example for a second that represent IKEA customers. Apologies if this is so low, you can't see it. That's fine. <laughs> um, then what is really important to note about this, number one, is this data has to be accurate. Mm. It has to be good. You can't put 
crap in the bottom and not get crap out the top. Yeah. So accuracy down here is really important. Now, obviously, we work with location data, so we've spent years and years, I guess, building framework to make sure we can scrub and clean and make sure location data that we do work with is accurate and that it works or that it's, that it's viable. It's just a smaller portion than it used to be sort of 12 months, 24 months ago. It has to be, and this is incredibly important, consented. Yeah. Of course it has to be consented. You, you know, this is not space, especially in Europe, where you're working with yeah, yeah, any yeah. dodgy data. This is when you're seeing people opt in, when they're allowing you to track their data, they're allowing their data to be used for advertising, you can use it as a baseline for analytics. Right. Uh, and then it has to be representative. So you can't take the behavior of two people and say, okay, well, this represents everybody that shops in Ikea. It can't just, you know, it has to be meaningful. So I think we talk a lot about representative data, about statistical significance, and making sure that when you're doing any kind of um, modeling, it's, it's using a baseline of data that is viable initially. Mm -hmm. If that gets too small, eventually, this, this will be under threat as well. But at the moment, we're at a point where this is looking, this is this working really well. Right. So what does, what does uh, the last thing is it should be useful. This kind of goes without saying. So not all data is created equal. We believe, of course, that location data is very powerful. We believe yeah. that where you go says a lot about you. So back to my Ferrari example, if I'm actually getting off my bum and going to a Ferrari dealership, a Lamborghini dealership, looks more indicatively likely I could be a Ferrari customer <laughs> in my dreams. If I actually get up and go to the gym three times a week, as opposed to just reading articles about fitness, it shows you that I'm, I'm actively engaging in an activity. I'm more likely to be susceptible to a, a brand new Nike or Asics trainer because I'm actually going to the gym rather yeah. than reading fitness things. So, you know, for example, that utility can come in many different ways. That first party data example I gave you, of course, how, how powerful is Starbucks customer data? How mm. powerful is it going to be to know that you've got Starbucks app on your phone? Um, and this is privacy for us because they're all consented. Consented. Um, and this is, you're building a, a, a sort of a, a model ingesting other data points and then extrapolating and then activating it. Um, we'll talk about the activation piece. Yeah. Um, in a minute. So in the old world, these IDs, and I hope this is viable, would have just been taken and pushed into an activation platform. Yeah. So this could be the trade desk. It could be anyone. Let's put the trade desk as an example. Yeah. So literally, send the device IDs, send the cookies, target them. Now, that's not going to be viable anymore. This is too small. There's not enough of them. Mm -hmm. There's not going to be a good match rate. There's going to be problems. This, it will continue to work, but it, it will not work by itself, and mm. it will get threat. So what, instead, what we have done is we have fed this to try and understand more about who these people are. Mm. And we're looking to understand anonymized signals that make them unique, mm. not more personal data. So a couple of examples, key ones. Where do we see these people spending their time? Now, not in terms of single household. Of course, we're not going anywhere near as precise as that because that's just turned, that would be just translating personal data into more personal data, but in terms of where they live at an aggregated level. So for example, I live in KT6, postcode area, um, or I might live in SW4. I might work in KT6, sorry, in SW4, but I might live in KT6, where we can start to look at, okay, well, we understand, this is SW4, this is KT6, we see a very high likelihood of finding this particular audience, let's use my IKEA baseline as the example, this IKEA audience, we see them spending time during the day, so we know that their residential sort of baseline is here, their work baseline is here. Part one, quite simple, mm -hmm. and it's it's not it's it's sort of more it's more granular, but it's still aggregated to a point where it's not personal data because of course there's a lot of people that live in KT6 or SW4. The key then becomes looking at other signals. So within KT6, within within let's use this one as a baseline. Now we look to say, okay, for the for the data that we see here, what do we see them doing in terms of publisher and in terms of time? So here we've talked about, I guess this is part one. This is what do we see them doing in terms of location? Part two is then what do we see them doing in terms of publisher? So we might see in KT6 clusters of behavior, different publishers that are indexing really highly for being an IKEA customer. So we take those publishers out. So we understand, OK, well, if you're in KT6, if you're being seen on these publishers, that makes you much more likely to be an IKEA customer. Yeah. And then last but not least, we feed time into this. OK. So this is sort of part one is location. Part two is time, uh, is publisher. Part three is then time. So this changes over time. So if I'm an IKEA customer and I live here, I may have different reading habits in the morning, different habits at night. I can tell you I sit on my sofa and play embarrassing games for hours in the evening once my kids have gone to bed, but in the morning all I'm doing is Googling things like train times and bus apps. Very different behavior on my phone, sadly. Um, so feeding time into this is really important. Understand that this, every single hour of the day, looks different. Yeah. This we essentially have built 
and we build what we call bidding rules. So this feeds a really complex list of buying rules that essentially change almost every single hour of the day, saying if we see this combination of publisher and location, publisher plus location, all broken down by every single hour of the day, so 9 a.m., 10 a.m., and of course, you know, weekends, weekdays, behavior very different. If we make buying decisions based on this, we're going to find an audience that is very close to the originating audiences, but also entirely using data that is personal, that is free of personal data. Yeah. So at this point, what we're using is location. We, use that, we do that using IP address. We're talking about publisher, which is, of course, what you're reading. It's context. So what, what are you reading right now? And what bit of the publisher are you reading? And time. And these are signals that are not necessarily personal data. OK. So that would be your sort of execution, media execution, uh, segmentation, uh, and activation. But then what about the measurement piece? Measurement is equally a problem. This currency is, if anything, been more important yeah. for measurement. Yeah. Some types of measurement are not going away. So if we talk about any sort of, of your traditional engagement me me measurements, so that's how many people have finished watching a video, mm. how many people mm. have engaged with an ad, they've always been a really good baseline for digital yeah. media. They're fine. Yeah. Things that are really under threat, for example, would be e-commerce shopping, where you follow somebody right through to purchasing a product. That uses cookies, that uses yeah. device IDs. Look back what are you going to be? Yeah, exactly. Cetera. What are you going to be able to do? I mean, you're going to be able to follow this little portion through. So if, let's say, for 15%, you're still able to buy a little bit because they've got the same yeah. Yeah. IDs, fine. But suddenly what you've got is only the ability to do measurement on a small portion. And with measurement, you need quite a lot more data to get statistical significance if you're doing any kind of yeah. modeling or any kind of, in, any kind of extrapolation. I think the key is going to be around thinking about um, a shift to focus back on those engagement metrics, a shift towards brand metrics. You know, Retention-based metrics. Retention-based metrics. But, mm. I think it's going to be a bit of the meeting of the old and a bit of the new. I think okay. with, unfortunately, with digital media, we've kind of gone quite far down that tracking space, and it's going to be very difficult. Yeah, we've to gone back. too far in the micro stuff. So yeah, the one-to-one -one, uh, is probably dead, but um, there's nothing wrong with the, uh, you know, the old models that could make it work. So yeah. Yeah. Uh, so why is this? Why does this approach matter so much? Why is it so useful? Uh, I guess a couple of things. Number one, this is super useful because it doesn't rely, does not rely on personal data. And this is important because that little pie chart I showed you earlier, mm -hmm. this is reaching 100%. There of that you go. Chart. I mean, that's the key problem. Every single ad that's being served using this kind of methodology, you're right down here in terms of 100% of the reach. And that is the mic drop. Uh, <laughs> and uh, I think like um, it's great to see frameworks popping up that actually address the problem and really look at the signals we have, which are not terrible. Um, the rules of the game have changed and it, the, 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 the industry hasn't caught up with it yet. Mm -mm. But it's good to see that you, know, you guys are looking at it from a, like we've got this incredible resource or this incredible signal, which is location, but we've also got a model that can ingest that alongside the existing sort of signals to build a sort of uh, segmentation piece and an activation piece that allows us to do what we used to do in the space, which is basically do, you know, uh, really granular targeting against yeah. the audience you want to hit. Uh, and on that note, I think uh, we'll, we'll finish up there. Right? That was brilliant. Uh, what, what, a, what a journey through the existing problem and, and, and talking about a new framework um, that's going to work in the new world. So, Good. Amy, thank, thank you very much for your time. You're welcome. I hope this is legible. It's brilliant. Uh, <laughs> next, we'll probably not talk, we'll talk about measurement next time around. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> uh, I want to thank you for coming today. That was yeah, brilliant. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. And that was Trader Talk TV, and we will see you next time.